Welcome to the FF Forge. My name is Steve, and today we're going to go over ADP risers and fallers. And the main thing here is just to see coming into the weekend for each position, uh, quarterback, tight end, wide receiver, running back, are you going to be able to maybe wait around later for some of these guys than you've been um, expecting to have to take them in? Or maybe are you going to have to reach a round or two earlier in order to ensure that you get them if they're your targets. That's the main por uh, point of looking at these things that you are already seeing the quarterbacks were on the screen. So if there's a negative number over here, that means their ADP, for instance, for Trey Lance here, has fallen by 34 and a half spots on average over the past. This was since, I believe, August 5th, so over like the past four weeks or so. I will also go over some notes and advice for each position uh, just leading into your draft, leave you with a couple of tidbits to think about. Let's start off looking at the quarterbacks, looking at guys who have been falling in drafts. Anything less than uh, you know 12 picks isn't a rounds difference, but still good to know those. So, you know, look at some of those names. I do expect some of these trends to to increase going you know into the weekend. This is when the most people are paying attention to news, and so especially in home drafts. I think you can expect some of these trends to exaggerate. So when we look at guys like Jared Goff, Sam Howell, CJ Stroud, Matt Stafford, I think you could probably feel pretty comfortable if you've been used to getting a guy like Jared Goff. If you were used to taking him in the 10th round, you could probably take him in the 11th round now fairly safely. That's where he's going. Or if you were reaching for him in the 9th round because you like him a lot, you can probably wait until the 10th round. That's the kind of thing that you can take away from this. To a greater extent, we are seeing um, Russell Wilson has fallen by about two rounds over this past month. Kyler Murray, about three rounds. He did go on IR. So what I did over here on the way left, uh, any of these that are in red are beyond player players who are have an ADP that was lower than 210, which would be a 15-round, 14, uh, yeah, 14 league draft just to give you an idea of where that cutoff is. Then when we go down into the draft, looking at players who have been rising, we see Baker Mayfield's stock has been flying. So he's a guy who may be going at the end of drafts now. Same with Ryan Tannehill's getting kind of close into that area. But this is especially a guy you see this rise in stock by 79 spots over the last month. Don't be surprised if you see him getting taken at the end of your drafts. I know there was just an episode with uh, the fantasy footballers who talk, spoke good about him, so I'm sure that will help his draft stock as well. Then um, Ryan Tannehill has seen a, a, quite a rise. Same with Mac Jones, Desmond Ritter. More importantly, uh, Brock Purdy's a guy who, if he's a target of yours, he's been rising. Definitely will have to go about a round earlier than maybe you're used to going. Then looking at some of the notes I have here, when looking at average fantasy points per week, the quarterback position in any given week, the QB1 on any given week, has a lower ceiling but a higher floor than the RB1, the wide receiver one, and the tight end one by a long ways as compared to the tight end one. So that's a, a lower ceiling but a higher floor. Just something to keep in mind if you take a quarterback really high in the draft, you are lowering, you know, immediately starting with a team that has a not an incredible ceiling but a good floor. However, by the quarterback 6 as well as the quarterback 12, you're going to find that there is a higher ceiling than at the running back, wide receiver, tight end 6 and 12. You get the biggest value advantage for the position at the quarterback 6 spot. And by the time that you reach the quarterback 18 in any given week, it's in line with the running back 18s and the wide receiver 18s. So uh, that's more for deeper leagues really, uh, two quarterback or super flex leagues, I should say, or 14 team leagues, I suppose that could be helpful information. Then when we look at the quarterback position, the health of the quarterback position, there is a 56% chance that your quarterback is going to start for all but one or two teams. That is going to put them uh, roughly in line as the healthiest position to have uh, definitely healthier than tight ends and running backs. Then for the quarterback replacement value, if your quarterback goes down, how easy is it to replace them? And in the event of an injury, you have roughly a one in three shot at finding a similar quality replacement option. And that's even for the elite quarterbacks. Not, I, I do say similar for a, a very specific reason here. 
Not exactly the same, but even for elite quarterbacks, you still have a decent shot of finding enough production out of a quarterback to help pull you through a few weeks. Not necessarily, you know, give you the advantage that you may have had from those like top three quarterbacks. You can find some pretty decent production. So that to me says, you know, if you're one of the people taking a quarterback at the front of a draft, at least you're taking a position that's uh, relatively healthy. And if you needed to find a replacement for it, you're going to be able to find something that's not totally, you know, a total dog pile compared to what you previously had. I mean, yeah, decent shot. One and three is not bad for these odds. Then I have a little bit of advice for single quarterback leagues and then a little bit of advice for super flex two quarterback leagues uh, when it comes to drafting. For single quarterback leagues, the moment that all of the quarterbacks that you feel have, I'm going to say pretty much top four quarterback upside have been drafted. If you don't think that that player has a shot at being a top four quarterback on the season anymore, you can fade the position for a little while during your draft. Just make sure to make an attempt to ensure that you get a quarterback that you feel will get you like top 13 quarterback, essentially a QB1, borderline QB2 kind of guy. For these super flex or two quarterback leagues, if you draft the single best and the single worst starting quarterbacks at the end of the year, you can still expect to have a net positive output from your quarterback position. The, the best quarterback is going to give you such an advantage at the position, and the worst quarterback is going to be close enough to plenty of other quarterbacks in, you know, uh, that other teams are starting that you still should end up have had – have – have having had the uh, quarterback position be an asset to your fantasy team. And the same cannot be said if you get two quarterback twos on your roster or even a back-end QB1 and a high-end QB2. It just doesn't work like that. So if you do get one of those elite quarterbacks on your roster, that's awesome. And to me, this is one situation where I am going to give you my lesson from that kind of information is don't be cheap at the quarterback position. Get yourself a stud QB one if possible. But if you don't do that, get yourself two top 12 quarterbacks because then you'll still be in a net positive situation. But like I said, once you get into the, the uh, middle in QB one and a middle in QB two or something like that, it's not going to be an asset for your roster anymore. Let's move on to looking at the tight end position. The risers and fallers looking at the fallers. So most of these guys probably weren't getting drafted. I would say Michael Mayer. You can probably wait until the very end of your draft in most leagues. And same with Mike Gesicki if you like him. And Hunter Henry's borderline there under 200. So those are the main guys that if you have targets on them, um, you no longer need to maybe take them... Uh, the second to last round, you could just wait to the last round for him. Other fallers, Zach Ertz has been falling in drafts, and that's I'm gonna expect that to extend. He was put on. He's recently come out and said he didn't know if he would play week one. So obviously that gives you a little bit of concern as to how healed up he is and at his age and everything. And they have Trey McBride, rookie who came in with a lot of expectations just last year, so he could definitely still realize those expectations are all, all things that make you think maybe I don't want to draft Zachers, and apparently the community has felt that way. Irv Smith Jr., you're able to get about two rounds later than maybe you've been having to take him, so keep that in mind. Chico Conquo has been falling. Solid round later, you can get him. Greg Dulcich, Taysom Hill, uh, Dalton Schultz, Gerald Everett, Juwan Johnson, all these guys... Feel free to wait on them if you see if you see something else on the, the uh, draft board that you want. I will say, I mean, at the end of the day, we do this to have fun. So, like, have fun with it. You know, we spend a lot of time and energy, some of us at least, into looking at all of this stuff. But, like, have fun with your draft. I'm here to hopefully give you some advice to help you have fun in the winning aspect. But, you know, draft your players. Now, looking at some of the risers at the position, Darren Waller's been rising a little bit. Would have thought that'd be higher, actually, but must have already been on the rise earlier this month. But Tyler Higby and Jake Ferguson both going. You would probably have to reach around higher than you've kind of been uh, if you've been practicing on mock drafts and whatnot this last month. Going into your real draft, I would expect to just, uh, if you want them and you want to make sure that nobody else gets them, go around higher than you've been used to. Then Luke Musgrave, you could maybe go around or two higher. He's been going quite a bit higher. 
and very much rising. When we look at some of the notes for the tight end position, once again, just looking at the average fantasy points per week scoring, the tight end one in any given week is not equal to the quarterback one, not the ceiling is not equal to the quarterback one's floor. In fact, the median of the QB6 is roughly equal to that of the tight end one's range of expectations. The tight end one does have the higher ceiling and a lower floor than the QB6, just to give you an idea of the comparison, but right in the middle kind of of that range is the QB6's expected range of scoring. That's the most likely range of outcomes would be roughly equal to each other. The ceiling of a tight end one in any given week might outscore the wide receiver one or the running back one's floors. So in some situations, you would be able to outscore the wide receiver one or RB one, but not the QB one. Also, just to give you an idea of how quickly the tight end position falls, the tight end six in any given week is going to be no better than the running back 18 for that given week, the wide receiver 21 in that given week, or also the quarterback 21 in that given week. But one thing that we do know about the tight end one season long, but also in any given week, is that it gives you a huge advantage compared to other tight ends in the, within the position. And the tight end one on any given week will almost certainly outscore half of your league's tight ends by two to three times more fantasy points, at the least. So that's good. In addition, the top t five tight ends should manage to put up these kinds of numbers at a rate of two to two and a half times the rate of other starting quality tight ends. And by these numbers, I mean get you tight end one type of numbers four or five times instead of uh, one to three times for the lesser tight ends throughout the entirety of the season. Then when we look at the health of tight ends, there is a 50% chance that your tight end will start for you in all but one or two games. So a little bit less healthy than the quarterbacks we saw. The big thing will be, is it more or less healthy than the running back position? Then when we look at tight end replacement, it is limited but plentiful. It's limited because you cannot replace your top five tight end. Like if you draft a top five tight end and they are part of that 50% that doesn't play for you in almost all the games of the year or gets injured for a lengthy period of time, you are SOL. But you should be able to find yourself someone who gives you roughly a 50-50 shot against the rest of your league mates, which isn't the worst case scenario. You just become you know, everybody else at the position and you lose the big advantage that you did spend a lot of draft capital on is the concern there. A lot of people stream tight ends, right? Well, when you are streaming tight ends, you have a one in three chance of outscoring your opponent, assuming your opponent is also not streaming tight ends, is putting a starting quality tight ends out there, which is not bad. And that's straight up outscoring. That's not even roughly being equal to. Now, when you are drafting tight ends or throughout the season, if you're looking for tight ends, I think there's a couple of things that you want to look for in that tight end or with the team that they play for. First of all, you want boom. The, the big factor for tight end success comes down to touchdowns, one of the least sticky and least predictable stats that there are, unfortunately, but you want chances at getting touchdowns. How do you increase the chance of that happening for the tight end that you have? Well, you get them on an offense that will get into the red zone and score a lot, of course, especially if they're a pass-happy team. That helps. Number two, you get a tight end who isn't asked to block a lot. Along with that, might as well just get a tight end who can't block. The team's not going to ask him to block if he can't block. Get a good receiving tight end. These things are kind of obvious, but I think it helps if you're looking at two or three tight ends to go through this like a checklist. Who, who fits the description the best? And the fourth thing is to grab a tight end who is not a part of a team with a loaded receiving core. Those are my keys to success for a tight end. Once again, it's kind of no-brainers, but when you put it in a checklist and then you look at a player and compare and contrast two guys or something like that, um, I think that can help you whittle down a couple of those, uh, narrow down those decisions and come to a conclusion that hopefully is the best decision. Moving on to the wide receiver position. So you see we have a lot of guys who have been falling out of being drafted. Wandale Robinson here, Rashid Shaheed were both guys who might get drafted at the end of your drafts. No longer. So if you like one of them, 
you can get them in the last round probably pretty safely. Same with a lot of these guys. But let's look at some of these names who are still being drafted. Jamison Williams. You can get him two rounds later fairly safely, maybe one and one to two, depending on exactly where you are in the draft. Then Traylon Burks had a little bit of an injury in training camp. Looks like he's going to be perfectly fine. And he also had DeAndre Hopkins join the team. I believe that was probably more than a month ago now, but still his ADP has been sliding, so you can get him, I think, at a perfectly fine value a little bit later than you used to be able to. Rondale Moore has been slipping. I would expect that to definitely be one that will continue to slide. Kadarius Tony, we have been seeing slide. This is, uh, if you've been drafting for a while, this has been very obvious, so you can continue to get him a little bit later in drafts than you were at one point. Same with Darnell Mooney. Donovan Peoples-Jones, Rashad Bateman, you can definitely get a little bit later than you used to. Jacoby Myers has been sliding because nobody gets excited about that. Michael Gallup has been sliding. Same reason, I'm not too excited about him. Now, Alec Pierce is basically sliding out of the draft right now. K.J. Osborne basically sliding out of drafts. There you go. When we look at players who have been rising, starts off with, um, let's go Jalen Hyatt, but there's a couple of names there to keep in mind. Makes I think all the names make sense. Calvin Ridley has been rising a little bit. Um, that, that's been very evident. He has been on the rise. Rasheed Rice has been on the rise again. Uh, this is basically, just to let you know if you feel comfortable, this is basically right where I have him ranked, where he goes. Um, so I would feel you know comfortable taking a shot at that if you like him a lot. Then Zay Flowers, Marvin Mims uh, Jr., Sky Moore, all have been rising, and these are definitely guys that I think if you want to guarantee that you get them in the draft, be prepared to take them three to four rounds earlier than you um, have been able to over the last some time. Uh, let's say about two rounds earlier, maybe three rounds earlier since I am looking back at dated information from August 5th, and if you've just been looking at drafts. But still, I expect this trend, these trends to continue for these players is what I'm getting at. Now let's look at the wide receiver notes and advice that I have. Once again, looking at wide receivers, average fantasy points scored on a weekly basis for this first set of information, looking at the wide receiver one in any given week. I have a slightly higher floor than the running back one, but they do not have a higher ceiling than the RB1. However, the wide receiver X, 6, 12, 30, any, any of them after essentially right after the wide receiver one versus the running back of the same value, 6, 12, 30, etc., that wide receiver is going to have a higher ceiling the rest of the way, all the way down. So wide receiver 6 has a higher ceiling than the... RB6 in any given week on average. Also, the weekly advantage that the wide receiver 12 has over the wide receiver 18. The wide receiver 18 has over the wide receiver 21. 21 over wide receiver 24, etc. is incredibly and increasingly minimal all the way through to the wide receiver 60. There is just not a lot of parity amongst a lot of wide receivers beginning essentially as early as the wide receiver 18. And to me, that is an argument for solely taking shots during your draft on guys who have high ceilings. Just purely looking for the potential, not taking the Curtis Samuels of the world who have a great floor, but we know there is zero chance that Curtis Samuel will be a wide receiver one come the end of the season. It just ain't going to happen couple of other things here. The elite wide receivers tend to score at a wide receiver one level at a rate that is four times greater than the rest of the starting quality receivers. So those best wide receivers really, really give you that, that top advantage that you can get at the position quite regularly. It's a very, very good advantage to have. And if you can, this is the best way if you want a wide receiver, the wide receiver position to be your strength. Get one of those top three wide receivers, if you can, or at least guys who have that kind of uh, potential in your mind. Get a top 10 wide receiver and get a top 24 wide receiver. You will have advantages across the board against all opponents in your league if you can manage to pull those three things out of the bag for the wide receiver position. If you're not able to do that, or if you're finding yourself in a spot where you're building your roster and you know there's other value that you don't want to pass up on on the board, 
at least try to get yourself a top 18 wide receiver and a top 30 kind of wide receiver. If you can get those two, you're going to find yourself at least in the running with other teams, wide receiver ones and wide receiver twos a lot of weeks. When we look at the health of wide receivers, there is a 50 to 60% chance that your wide receiver will start for all but one or two games somewhere in there. So we'll just say about a 55% chance, roughly equal to the quarterbacks, actually. Then when we look at uh, wide receiver replacements, if your wide receiver goes down, how easy is it to replace them? Well, unlike a tight end or a quarterback, and to more of a degree than running backs, there very often isn't a one-for-one replacement. What happens when a wide receiver goes down, for the most part, is that whatever target share they're leaving on the table gets spread amongst the other weapons that the team is already relying on, and of course, somebody else is going to play and get an opportunity. Yes, but it happens way less than, once again, at a quarterback position, a quarterback comes in and they're going to get a shot, and uh, maybe they'll take advantage of that shot. For The same for a tight end. The running back, a lot of times two guys might take over for the starting running back, but with the wide receiver, it's going to be like four guys that are going to be getting that, that target share split amongst each other, now increasing their values incrementally and not really giving you somebody on the fantasy waiver wire to say, hey, I can get that guy, and they're going to be just as good as the guy that I got. But there is a lot of depth at wide receiver. There's always waiver wire guys out there, unless you're in a super deep league. My last bit of advice here, or my bit of advice going into your draft and going into weeks one and two for the wide receivers is to be aggressive. Keep an eye out for guys on your waiver wire who have a big week one. They have a pretty good track record of becoming good fantasy starters at, at some point in the season. On average, those week one guys who pop off are going to be more valuable than guys who might pop off in week 12. So be aggressive early on in the season. Also, late risers and fallers leading into draft day, something that we're kind of looking at here, tend to be, it's, it's reliable information that you're getting leading into the draft. Pay attention to the guys that you are hearing either a bunch of question marks from many different sources get brought up about, whether it be injury question marks or potential question marks of like, yeah, I just don't see the ceiling with this guy, those kinds of things. Listen to those if you're hearing it from more than one of your people that you listen to. And if you're hearing a few names being shouted from the top of the roofs, you should also be listening to those because a lot of the times those guys that are rising late in draft season end up being... um. Pretty good. So that's your Sky Moore, your Marvin Mims, your Zay Flowers, Rasheed Rice, uh, some of those guys. Uh, keep an eye, Darius Slayton. He's one that's definitely risen for me. I think he's definitely draft worthy. Let's move on to the running backs. Actually, for the wide receivers, just a couple of uh, guys that are one name now being drafted that wasn't on there. It is an ADP 276, but they. Previously, we're not on the list that I used to come up with these risers and fallers. Is Josh Reynolds, and he is somebody who I've spoken about like once or twice this off season. Um, I can't seem to get him like high enough in my rankings to sit there and recommend drafting him. But he's going to be like the second best wide receiver on that Detroit Lions offense, quite potentially for some time at least, for like the first six weeks, very possible. And names that have fallen out of favor over this past month no longer seem to be drafted at all. Puka Nakua, which I found a little bit surprising, but just hasn't had any buzz. Um, but I think still a guy who might be worth taking a shot on. Then Khalil Shakur and Tyquan Thornton. And Tyquan Thornton has been put on IR, so he's not a name to worry about. Now when we look at the running backs, risers, fallers, we have been seeing Kendra Miller fall, and he's probably going to continue to fall because he is currently going through an injury. I want to say it's hamstring, so he'll be falling for a reason, but if you're looking to get him at value, you probably can. Same with Deonta Foreman. I don't recommend that one. Brees Hall has slid. Um, that probably has halted to roughly yeah i think that adp is probably pretty steady right now devon a chain may continue to fall or he may start to rise a little bit because jeff wilson jr was just put on ir uh, tyler algier has been falling that's when i expect this trend to maybe be exaggerated so if you like him you might be able to wait around on that Jonathan Taylor has obviously been falling. Then uh, CEH, Cordero Patterson, Damian Harris, Dalvin Cook, all other names who we have been seeing fall about a round or more. And you can see some of the other names who have also been falling. 
a lot of running backs falling there, but there's plenty rising too. And some of the biggest risers that we've seen, Kyron Williams, uh, that makes sense with what happened with that running. Some, it makes sense for a reason, okay? But if you really want some of these guys, maybe think about taking them one round before the end of the draft because there might be somebody else who's also rising on some of these names. I just saw my buddy took Joshua Kelly, somebody who really hasn't been taking all offseason in his draft. Um, not even too late in the draft. So, you know, it's important to know these names. Deuce Vaughn, if you want him, you're going to have to go much higher than you used to have to go to get him. Same with Kenneth Gainwell. Um, I think he's been pretty steady here around. If you want him, if you really want him, you got to reach for him in like the 10th round, but you should be able to get him in the 11th round. Uh, Zamir White's been rising for some reason after the Josh Jacobs situation has been resolved, I guess. So probably not. Maybe this is probably one where I wouldn't, this might be noise at this point. Uh, but Tanks Bigsby's definitely been rising. Jalen Warren has definitely been rising. Ezekiel Elliott has been rising. Makes sense since then. James Cook uh, has definitely been rising in drafts too. So I agree with this list. These are guys that you may have to get a little bit earlier than you used to. Now let's look at some notes and advice for the running back position. The running back one has the highest ceiling of any position and the lowest floor compared to the wide receiver one and the quarterback one in any given week once again. Unfortunately, they do score below average at a rate of, of below the average for the RB1 spot at a rate of two out of three games. So they don't tend to hit that ceiling very often, but they do have a really high ceiling when it happens, when everything clicks. It can be monstrous to more of a degree than even wide receivers just tend to be a little less reliable to get that have that happen in any given week or year also the weekly advantage of the running back 12 versus the running back 18 versus the running back 24 versus the running back 30 is significant unlike the wide receiver there is a bit of a gap each and every week it becomes less significant as you go along but it is still more distinct than the, uh, that of the wide receiver position once you get to the running back 30 and beyond as far as running back health, they are by far the outlier for health. There is a 33% chance that your running back will start for all but one or two games. It's a one in three chance that your running back will be incredibly available. That's it. As far as finding replacements for your running backs, though, that's a different story. I found that in 2021, due to seven injuries, there were 23 fantasy-relevant players that came about just from seven injuries. The running back position is like a hydra. When you cut off one head, two more grow behind it. Due to those injuries, 25% of the season's top 48 running backs came about. 11 running backs out of the top 48 is about 25%. I know how to do 44 quicker than that. That was bad. Of those 23 names, about eight became flex-worthy or better starters, and that's better than a 33% chance of finding a solid replacement. So it's the easiest position to find a replacement at. And out of those eight names, we have three to four of them. One of them's borderline here, but three of them for sure became running back ones. One of them was on the cusp of RB1, RB2 territory. Two of them were straight up RB2s, and two of them were flex starting quality guys. So you you can get a replacement that's better than what you lost when an injury happens. That's always possible. And so that brings me to my draft advice. You can make any draft strategy work, especially for the running back position. Draft to your strengths. Have fun. So for instance, if you've had good luck going with a zero running back strategy, then go ahead and do it. Who cares what others have to say? If you've had good luck taking three running backs in the first three rounds, then go ahead and do it. There are valid arguments and valid counter arguments to any kind of running back strategy that you want to implement. So it's a give and take. With a little bit of good luck taking running backs high, assuming that you take the correct ones, of course, is very much worth it. With a little bit of bad luck, you will lose that draft capital. But... At least with a little bit of good luck, then you have a decent shot at replacing your loss to some extent and possibly as a one for one replacement or maybe even better. Just a quick note on draft quarterback dr running backs that are now being drafted that previously were not did not make this list previously. 
Uh, Dion Jackson now being drafted ADP of 163, so that should be, um, I think, into the early uh, 14th round. Then uh, Rico Dowdo has been rising, starts to get drafted. I've talked about him several times lately. Xander Horvath is starting to get drafted to some extent. I have no clue why, and I love the guy, but I don't see any situation where he's fantasy relevant. And then Justice Hill, I've talked about him a fair bit recently. He's started to get drafted to some extent that he um, made it onto the ADP list that I download. And let's not ignore the DSTs and the kickers. Little note and advice here. So any given week, top six DSTs give you a higher ceiling than top six kickers do. DSTs are better than kickers. However, that flips somewhere by the kicker 12 compared to the DST 12. So back-end starting kickers are actually more valuable than back-end starting DSTs. However, when you're drafting, we don't know who those back-end starting DSTs and back-end starting kickers are going to be, so you still probably want to take a DST before you take a kicker. That's all. So wrap. Good luck with your drafts. Seriously, good freaking luck. Have some fun with it, and... We'll catch you with, uh, I guess, we're going to be doing some re- week one rankings quickly. Maybe do a little waiver wire research. Thank you very much. Peace out.